We don't need to rely on historical and cultural forces to live a good life. More ancient, more powerful, deeper forces are at work that have been shaping us for goodness for a much longer time. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Super excited to be talking about our blueprint for goodness. We have Dr. Nicholas Christakis joining us on the show. Hello. Thanks for having me, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on. That's nice. It's really nice. So, so honored that you decided to join us on the show. This has been such a good synthesis, your latest book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society, and just recently released, and we'll be talking about that a lot on the show. For those that don't know, Nicholas's background, he's a sociologist and physician known for his research on social networks and on the socioeconomic, biosocial, and evolutionary determinants of behavior, health, and longevity. He is a Sterling Professor of Social and Natural Science at Yale University, where he directs the Human Nature Lab. He's also the co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science, and you can find all of the links in the bio to his profile there at Yale, as well as the Human Nature Lab, as well as his Twitter profile and the link to his recent book. All right, Nicholas, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Well, I'm, I mean, that's like over home plate. I mean, that's what the book is about. <laughs> yeah. I know that's not a hard question. Uh, I think, I think when, when um, I think for far too long, in my view, scientists and the person on the street have been far too obsessed with the dark part of our nature, um, our propensity to violence and selfishness and mendacity and tribalism. But I think the bright side has been denied the attention it deserves because equally we are prone to be good. Uh, we are prone to have these wonderful capacities for love and friendship and cooperation and teaching. And I would argue these qualities are more prominent, more powerful, more forceful uh, in us than, uh, than the dark side. And the reason is that if, if whenever I came near you, you, um, you were mean to me or, uh, or killed me um, or mistreated me in some way, I would have been better off as an animal being you know, apart from you. We would have evolved to be solitary animals. So the very fact that we live socially in the way that we do uh, suggests that the benefits of a connected life must have outweighed the costs. And so the argument, my argument would be that over the long sweep of our evolutionary history, over 300,000 years, we've been shaped by natural selection to be endowed with these wonderful qualities, that these qualities are extremely powerful, that they are more powerful than the evil qualities, and furthermore that because we've been endowed uh, with those qualities by natural selection, they are universal. They are seen in every human being and in every society uh, around the world. And furthermore, in contrast, for example, to Steven Pinker's arguments about the progress that human beings have made over the last few hundred years because of the philosophical movements and technological advances um, of the Enlightenment, beginning since the Enlightenment, uh, which no doubt have redirected human trajectory and the trajectory of our world to be better. We're safer, we live longer, we are healthier. Uh, we have more technology, we have more democracy, more peace. He's no doubt right about all of that. But those forces are acting over, over historical time frames. And what I'm arguing is, is that we don't just, we don't need to rely on historical and cultural forces to live a good life. More ancient, more powerful, deeper forces are at work that have been shaping us for goodness for a much longer time. So that's my answer to your question, which I, you know, I'm glad to see you're asking. <sighs> there is something that's so deep in our human nature, this desire to collaborate, this desire for friendship, this desire to co-create mm. a positive, beautiful future together, to ensure peace between each other. All of these are so deeply rooted in us and since the dawn of time and I like how you take well, us Well, dawn back. of time goes quite a far, far way back. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would since say dawn of our species, species. might. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dawn of time. <laughs> the dawn of our whole species. order of magnitude, yeah. yes. Yeah. It could, 
and it could potentially even go to the dawn of time with the way of all the other evolution of the species that they also have this this deep essence no because of other species no other species don't live socially i mean i think that we are different than mm. uh than um the transmission of knowledge things like that that we can do yes yeah. but other species live solitary lives we are we are different than um than many insects we are different than uh than octopuses we're different than uh than um, you know, reptiles and uh, and fish, uh, so you know we we live socially in a very particular way. Yeah. And one of the things that I show in the book and that I argue and that is sort of paradoxical, is that if you, the the more we study certain other social mammals, the deeper understanding we have about ourselves. And, and here's why, as an example, if you go and you map the social networks of elephants, like the 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 mathematical structure of elephant networks. Uh, well, actually, let me back up just from that for a moment. So, it's very common. Many species reproduce sexually. Many species have sex with each other. But we do something else. We form long-term, non-reproductive unions to other members of our species. Yeah. Namely, we have friends. Yeah. And this is very rare in the animal kingdom. We do it. Certain other primates do it. Elephants, both Asian and African elephants, do it. And certain cetaceans uh, do it. Certain whale species. So this is an unusual feature that we evolved to have. This, but couldn't you say that a school of fish or a pack They're not of friends with each other. They're for long-term, non-reproductive unions to unrelated individuals. So those fish might be related to each other. They might be a transient interaction, like a herd of buffalo moving on a plane. It's not like I'm next to you as a buffalo and we're always together, you and I. That's a different kind of sociality, a different kind of social process. So I'm specifically okay. talking about friendship. Okay. And um, so we do it and so do elephants. And what's really interesting is, is that elephants, uh, and then as a result of these friendship connections, we form social networks mm -hmm. with very particular mathematical properties. So like if you map these networks and look at mathematical structures of these networks, they're very specific. And in fact, in some work we've done in my lab, we've, we've sent people around the world. We have mapped networks in Tanzania and uh, Uganda and the Sudan and India and Honduras and in places around the United States and again and again the structure of the networks is the same it's sort of universal which is part of the point I'm making which is and that you have a certain amount of like close friends and these like these third degree connections where you can spread your that's another whole to. topic that's, but <laughs> yeah but for now it's just that the like the, the 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 structure of the network the dots and the lines that connect them yeah you can summarize that in various mathematical ways is very similar around the world anyway if you go and you map networks in elephants, you find that elephants have friends and their networks look like our networks. Which is astonishing because the last common ancestor we had with elephants was 85 million years ago. That animal did not live socially. And so the elephants, by independent, convergent evolution, have f fixated on the same type of social process that we have. They have friendships. They didn't need to have friendships. They make networks that look like our networks that needn't have been the case. But here's the punchline. The deep irony here is, is that by looking at the similarity between us and elephants, we can come to make the following argument. If we can share the capacity for friendship with elephants, we can share it with each other. Yeah. The, the universality of this quality in us is proven in a way by its coexistence in this animal species. Yes. And furthermore, if you, if you, if you do anthropological investigations and you go around the world, and you look for societies and you try to quantify, is there a society without friendship? The answer is no. So this is a deep yeah, and yeah. universal property within human beings. And we must, we must have friends. And we must have them in order to be able to live socially. It's a, it's a part of our nature. Yes. And even the nature of other species that, that yes. we can look at and study. Will you show us on a network graph, show us what it would look like if you were the center node and then you had the similarities across species that we as a center node have connections, these mm -hmm. spokes to other nodes that mm -hmm. are then are, let's say, are friends. And then and they have their friends and, and so they on. Have their friends right. and so on. In the book, there are pictures of elephant networks. And if you look at the pictures of elephant networks and you look at the picture of human networks, or you look at the picture of whale networks side by side, they're 
very, they're indistinguishable. You know, you could see a picture of a human network. There are these dots and the lines. Uh, every dot is a person and every line between them represents a relationship between two people. Who's whose friend or whose sibling or whose mate, for example. And these, these, these dots and lines will form an intricate pattern that has a center and a periphery. And they'll be the social periphery, people who have relatively fewer friends and whose friends have fewer friends. And, uh, and a social center, people who have relatively more friends and whose friends tend to have more friends. And so you can map this graph and in your mind's eye you can also invoke a kind of metaphor of uh, uh, which is not exactly right, but at least you get a sense of it, like a tangle of Christmas tree lights where every bulb is a person and then the wires represent the connections. And you can imagine this dense gamish of Christmas tree lights when you take them out after a year in a box and you try to loosen them up by pulling out the tendrils of the Christmas tree lights and then they kind of spread out in front of you. Um, and, and then you can look at, you can do a similar process where you map networks of other species as like elephants and whales and they will look similar. Uh, another way to cultivate... Specific nodes have lots of connections, other nodes may not have a lot of connections. Yes, but it's not just that, it's that the whole structure, it's like saying, you know, I could take a group of building materials and I can build a house, and, and the house is basically the same house. You could take the same materials and build houses with, that look different, but the house that we built is very similar to the, with the same materials as the house that an elephant will build. Or another way to cultivate an intuition about networks is to um, imagine you have a, a hundred buttons, like, like from a shirt, and they have, let's say, four holes, which is, is a simplification. But let's say each button has four holes, and you strew the buttons on the floor, and I give you 500 pieces of string, and I say, you're going to pick two buttons at random and connect them. Mm, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, and yeah. then you're going to use the next piece of string and the next piece of string. One Always button's going to have a more of the, and there's going to be a power log. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So by chance, you should have the intuition that some buttons might not have been picked at all. They'll have no friends. They'll have no connections. And other buttons might have been picked a lot of times. And so that's the first realization that the, that there'll be this jumble of strings and connections and buttons. People are the buttons. The strings are the relationships. And you should have the recognition that if you look at, you could look at them down now on the floor and take a photograph of that mess. And, um, and, and then you could lean over and pick up one of the buttons and pull it up into the air. And uh, if you did that, you should have the intuition that all the other buttons that were connected to that would come up. But would all the buttons come off the floor? Only like 30 or so would well, come yeah, up out of the actually, hundred? Yeah, it's pretty good, your guess, actually. Probably more like 60, but not all of them. Yeah. It's very good, your Damn, guess. that's a pretty... 60 out of the 100? By so, chance will have been picked, yeah, yes. Wow. I'm well, because saying, they only yeah. need to have at least one thread. Oh, so, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so okay. some of them... So these buttons will come up, and then the other ones that were never picked, they'll be disconnected. They'll have their other sort of networks over there. Yep. And then you can take this little thing, and you should have a sense that there'll be this person here, and then... One string removed from him will be all the people that are one degree of separation, mm -hmm. and then another layer of buttons, two strings removed, yeah. all the people that are two degrees of separation from him, and so forth. And then you should have the intuition that if you take this, this jumble and drop it over there and photograph it again, the two photographs of the two jumbles will look different. And yet you should have the intuition that even though the photographs look different, there's something deep and fundamental which is hasn't changed at all. That's the particular or uh, uh, arrangement of the buttons with respect to each other. That's known as the topology of a network, the structure of a network, the architecture of a network. Anyway, that the, that type of structure. There's certain mathematical ways of describing it are seen around the world in, in all societies and also in elephants and whales and certain other primates. So that means there's something very deep and fundamental about that particular kind of structure to us. And, um, and it's inescapable, it's innate, it's natural, yeah. and good, I would argue. Wow. So you, there are mathematical properties about the way that our species organizes within our, with you, seeing it as, yes. a, as a topology. Yes. I like that. It's the topology, um, the topological representation of how our networks. Um, so the idea is then that other species have different topologies that they organize. No, into. other species have well, the same well, ones. Well, whales as us. and elephants, you said, but then and other primates. species. Well, no. And primates. But you also gave us indications that octopi or all these other. Yeah, they're different. They don't have friendships. See, that's what's interesting is that so certain. Um, the you can have other ways of living socially. Yeah, yeah. Like you yeah. social insects, so termites and wasps and so forth, but and, and ants. But the thing about the, those insects is that they're clones. They're genetically identical. They don't actually need friendship in order to be social. 
they just are nice to it's like being nice to yourself if you're an ant all the ants are the genetically <laughs> identical all an ants in a colony you think that's what it's like yes that, yes i is do that, wow so is that really what uh, the so, ants it would just be a bunch of clones like we're clones. talking like that's, millions of clones it's like just It'd the, be like identical a twins, yeah, like Nicholas is building yes. the ant structure. Yes, yes, that's right. And so then, why would you need to interact with the same per? Yeah, yeah. The, why the, yeah. would you need to be? Why would you need to single? I'll be nice to you and not him. You're all the same. We're all we're all siblings. We're all identical siblings. So so the ants have a different set of problems, and they're very instructive in understanding the origins of sociality. But they're different than us. The ants are different than us, and they're also different than animals that, for example, that the packs of wolves which often are very closely genetically related. They'll be the offspring of one sort of, let's say, uh, depends on the species, one particular male or female going back one or two generations. So they're, they're like cousins or siblings to each other. Those are all interesting. And there's also, we talked about schools of fish and herds of cattle, and they have all kinds of other social properties too. But the, all of those are incredibly interesting and we can learn a lot from them, but they are different <laughs> yeah, than, yeah, okay. than our problem, which is how do we organize our relationships with people who are unrelated to us. Mm. How do we how do we avoid killing each other mm. um, when there's no genetic reason to avoid killing each other? And so we have evolved a set of capacities um, uh, to do that. And so then the idea would be that if we were to run another simulation of the evolution of yes. planet Earth, that we would see a very similar mathematical yes. topology yes. of how we organize. Yes, and that's and that's what I'm saying with the elephants. So the elephants ran that experiment for us, <laughs> and they have all of these qualities, like they have friendship, they have um, cooperation, they have... Um, in-group bias. Uh, they have some mild hierarchy. They have identity. Now, this is a very interesting idea. So, you take it for granted that you have a unique identity as a person, and and that everyone does, mm -hmm. and that you can look out at a sea of people, and every one of them has a unique face, mm -hmm. and you can. That's how we signal our identity in our species. We use our faces, but why? I mean. It's, it's, it's an evolutionary luxury that we are able to have variable faces. Why don't we all have the same face? You know, like, uh, like penguins. Yeah. yeah, like the ants are like, well, that's a little bit complicated there. But yes, we're like penguins or, or cows or something. You know, we, we, we look at each other. And so it turns out the regions of our genome that are responsible for, for um, making our faces are very variable mm. and deliberately so, mm. so that we each have a different face that we can use to signal, this is me, not someone else. And the reason we do that is so that our, many reasons, so that our parents feed us and not strange kids. They can say, oh, that's my kid. Uh, they, we also want you to say, oh, that's my friend, not my enemy. I need to be able to tell apart to my tell friends. Apart. Yes. Yeah. So furthermore, not only do we have this, this evolutionary luxury of signaling our identity using our faces, but we also have this evolutionary luxury of being able to detect the difference. Like a big part of your brain is devoted to being able to tell the difference between other people's faces. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so all of this is very expensive. Why do we do that? Well, we do that in order to be able to live socially, to mm -hmm. be able to remember who's a cooperator and who's not, who's our friend and who's not, who's our partner and who's not. If you didn't care about who you had sex with, you wouldn't need to be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. But you do care about who you have sex with, so you need to be able to tell one person from another, for instance. And amazingly, elephants do this, and whales do this. By independent evolution, elephants have evolved the capacity to signal who they are and to recognize each other as individuals. So these, these qualities of identity, friendship, cooperation, and so forth, teaching, which we may come to later, yes. uh, all of these qualities are very wonderful, special qualities that we have that natural selection has equipped us with and that are crucial to us being able to live together and make a good life. Whoa, Nicholas, it's so interesting learning from you about the, <clears throat> the variability in our genome for the way that our unique identifier of yes. the space evolves so that we can more easily then, uh, for the mother to be like, oh, this is my child to feed, feed yes. or for um, no, to know friend to friend, yeah, lover, so for, identifying So, so for that. example, there's even differences between, in this regard, between rats and, um, and sheep. So for example, rats can't tell their pups apart. So you could take the rat pups from a mother's uh, little group of rat pups, swap out someone else's rat pups, and she'll feed them. She can't tell the difference. The reason is that rats have evolved the capacity to detect places rather than individuals. Mm. So they feed the rat pups in this area. Why? Because when their pups are born, they're immobile. 
So there's no need to know one pup, this is, this is this pup and this is this pup and they're mine and that's that pup and that's not mine. No, the rat pups can't move. So the rat mothers just learn, this is where my pups are in this location. I'll feed the pups here. So sneaky scientists can swap them around. But sheep, as soon as a sheep is born, it has to be able to, to move. Otherwise it would be prey. The ancestral sheep would have been eaten, the immobile ancestral sheep. So sheep, from the moment they're born, they can move. So in a big herd, how do mothers tell their offspring so that they feed their offspring and not someone else's offspring? They have evolved as they use scent. Ah. So they can signal scent uh, wow. uh, by scent. Biology so, is so cool. Yeah, and the yeah. evolutionary dynamics yeah. are so cool. Yes. Yeah, there's so much cool stuff like that when you spend decades yeah. studying it and finding these unique insights and sharing them with people so that we gain a better understanding of not only our own true these deep laws of our own human nature but also how other species have evolved and yes. and all these different mechanisms like scent and what yes. you're just describing nicholas explain to us what we should do about the power law dynamic that's evolved within our network topology because if this button string has yeah. 60 buttons on it yeah. and all these poor buttons over here have only by themselves or a couple well there typically three will be a second cluster so they'll be like a third 30. string of 30 look yeah yeah, yeah, yeah a second yeah. string of like 20 and then and then the remaining uh 10 or whatever will be on their own or couplets or something i don't know the precise distribution <laughs> but that's approximately right uh it's a little bit a little bit more complicated because in my example every button had four holes not mm. a variable number of holes anyway uh no the parallel thing is what you're alluding to is is that people vary in how many friends they have and earn how much wealth they have accumulated well, yeah, that's, another, that's thing. another power law yes that's, that's another thing so now what do we do about these unequal distributions of friends uh i wealth? think well <laughs> So friends, the distribution is not as unequal as you would think. We've looked at this. Okay. So on average, people have about 4.5 individuals with whom they're socially intimate. You can ask questions like, um, who do you discuss important matters or personal matters with? Or uh, and you might say your spouse and your sibling and your best friend and another best friend. Or who do you spend your free time with, we might ask you. Or we might say, I'm going to give you, we've done this, I'm going to give you something of value that you have to give to someone else. You can't keep. Who would you give it to? Mm. So I could use that heuristic it's a to great see. Question. Yeah. yeah. So I could use that heuristic to see who would you be anonymously generous to, yeah. right? Yeah. So we've done that. For instance, we've used um, in, amongst the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. We uh, they love honey, and uh, and in order to get honey, they have to do these risky things where they climb up trees. They don't have any protective equipment. Actually, they have a. They have a honey, I forgot what it's called, it's like a honey finder bird. There's like a, it's one of the rare examples of a human animal yeah. pairing in nature, a symbiosis with our species, mm -hmm. where these honey birds will identify where the beehives are, and then the Hadza will climb up and knock the beehive down, getting stung. They'll take most of the honey, but they'll leave behind some of the, some of the, um, the uh, what is it called? The, um, the honeycomb, the, comb, the honeycomb, yeah, yeah, yeah. and the birds eat that after they got the humans to knock it down. Anyway, the Hadza love honey, but it's a real pain for them to get it. We just went to Costco and bought honey sticks. <laughs> so we took these honey sticks to Hadza land in Tanzania, and um, we gave the Hadza respondents the honey sticks, and we said, you can't keep them. Who would you give them to? Interesting. And we mapped the networks of the Hadza that way. Anyway, you can map these networks um, using different sorts of techniques, and when you do that around the world, you find that about Two to five percent of people have no one when you ask them who do you spend free time with or who could you just discuss important matters with. Two to five percent say no, no one. Sad. In our society too, you have those approximately that number. They might be isolated widows, or they might be uh, people who never made friends or had other problems, for example. And at the upper end of the distribution, you might have uh, two to five percent or so. I don't remember the precise numbers who have eight people or more. But the great majority of people have in that range, and the average is about four and a half okay. um, people. So, so it's so so it's it's pretty tight. But yeah. there are when it comes to actual friendships, real relationships. When you look at other sorts of things like phone calls or Facebook friendships or Twitter followers, then you get a more power law distribution, where some people, you know, like the Kardashians or something, might have millions of followers and. The rest of us just have 10,000 or 10 followers or something. Mm -hmm. you know? And then what 
do you think we can do about the inequality in power law distributions for wealth or for well that's yeah, a this yeah. is a tough one well that's a different topic i mean i think that some inequality is a state of nature people are born with different talents it's called the natural lottery mm. some people are born very tall and others very short some people very fast and others very slow and some people are born very smart and others not so smart and, and this just is just a play of chance you know uh, now some of that is sometimes due to the environment if your mother was starving when you were in utero mm -hmm. this will hamper your own uh, life prospects mm -hmm. birth or I should stress by that example I should stress that by born I don't just mean endowed genetically you there can you can be born to a poor parent for example or you your birth order or your mother could have had an infection while she was pregnant with you mm -hmm. so there are other kind of phenomena in the environment that can affect your life chances at birth so when I say the natural lottery that's what I mean I mean things you didn't do things that just you were gifted at birth this was your life or whether you're born in in Greece or in South Dakota for example you know it just you know it just that's what happens you know that's just your lot you know that's the natural lottery so some of that is some of that inequality that we see in our species is also seen in other species other primate species and is irreducible and there may even be reasons for it but that's different than the social lottery the social lottery is then what the society do to you after you're born and are you in a society which for example exacerbates the natural inequality mm. or compensates for mm. it so here's an example let's say some people are born blind and some are not blind that's a working of the natural lottery mm. but then what does the social lottery do does it build a society in which we have braille books and and auditory, uh, you know, audible uh, um, uh, stoplights and uh, and elevators? And do we compensate for the natural lottery in a beneficial way, reducing the inequality? Or we build the neural prosthetics? Yes, or or yeah. we do other technologies, yeah, or said. or do we invest money in restoring sight to people who are born blind, mm. if that's possible in the distant future? Or do we build a society that exacerbates it? It's sort of, you know, it's sort of every man for himself kind of society, which then all of a sudden then widens the gap between the sighted and the unsighted. Mm. So, so the social lottery is different than the natural lottery. So an wow, so in a way we could think about it like, uh, when we see the power law that of, of wealth, that uh, inequality that's occurring, are we seeing the people that are find themselves at this very end of having so much of a surplus of wealth, do we see them building things incrementally that help themselves become more wealthy? Or do we see them building the things that compensate yes. for the wealth inequality to where people at the lower end of the distribution have more degrees of freedom and more opportunities yes. for them to or, pursue their own North Star and create endeavoring these types of things yes yes that's right that's and a cool way to view it yes and it's not just the people at the top but it could also be the state state actors mm. I mean are you in a state that attempts to for example redistribute wealth or or not um, and or grow wealth in certain ways that are beneficial to the bottom or grow wealth in certain ways that are not beneficial to the bottom etc um, now some we have done some experiments looking there's something called the Gini coefficient yes. which is a measure yes. of uh, inequality it goes from zero to one zero is perfect equality everyone has the same one is perfect inequality one person has all the wealth and everyone else has nothing um, and typically uh, the Gini's range from let's say uh, zero to about 0 0.4 would be American or Moroccan level of inequality and 0 0.2 would be sort of Scandinavian level of inequality when people have gone to hunter-gatherer societies that live as we did in the ancestral way, mm. forager societies, mm. and those people tend to have very few possessions, um, often because they have, they're very mobile, so there's not a lot of stuff they can take with them, mm -hmm. and they also don't have farm or, or, or cattle, you know, they, have, they don't have domesticated animals. So they have very few um, markers of wealth at all, but even in them, there is some inequality in terms of their assets. So. That you study in, the burial grounds and things like that. Yeah, or the too, goods. Yeah. Someone has a big bow and arrow and someone doesn't. Someone yeah. has 10 arrows, someone has 8, etc. So they, their inequality, their Gini is about 0 0.12, for instance. But even in those societies, you know, if you interview them and you say, well, who's a good hunter? They'll say, he's a good hunter and he's not. Mm. Natural lottery. Mm. Or mm -hmm. social lottery. Your father taught you to be a good hunter. His father did not teach him mm. to be a good hunter. Mm -hmm. So there's always some variation. And in fact, in Blueprint, I talk a little bit about how mild hierarchy 
or moderate egalitarianism is also a necessary part of a well-functioning society. Mm, mm. Societies that are absolutely equal tend not to function well. They're very chaotic. Someone's good at w one skill and they are great to then go and teach other people that skill and then I pick up a different skill and I help them with that skill that I know and then they help me with the skill that they know and we form into the hierarchies of competence that then help us do specific attributes that make the, fun the, f the entirety of the civilization function well with all of its unique components because we're all uniquely equipped in those competence hierarchies. Right, so you're exactly right. There could be that type of complementarity and there have been some arguments about how variation in human beings like you know you're strong and I'm smart or you can see and I can uh, you know uh, row mm. right so on the on you know on the, the Argonauts you know Jason famously had one guy who could see very far he had fantastic vision you don't need all ten of the sailors to see far just one is enough to see where the shore is the rest have to be able to row and you need one guy who can navigate by the stars right and so forth so you can form groups or for example ancestrally you could have some people who are very good at locating prey and other people who are very good at like spearing the prey let's mm. say so you're talking about complementarity but it doesn't just need to be that way because sometimes an exceptional individual can generate benefits for the or people around them um, even without any complementarity so for example a simple example of this might be someone who can who knows how to make a fire so we're all ten of us in a group we're cold one guy makes a fire for himself even selfishly but then we all benefit from the fire right we can all warm ourselves by the same fire yeah. so there, we don't even need to give him anything he's happy to do that he makes a fire just for himself mm. but he creates what's called an externality now that the rest of us can benefit from yeah. so Anyway, there are many advantages okay. to living socially. Oh, that is a good yes. one, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, I like that one. Um, all right, and I wanna, so so much of, of Blueprint and so much of what now the study of indigenous cultures and more deeply around the planet is showing to us, which is that we come from this same origin. We come from the same source. I'm curious what your thoughts are on us all coming from a same source or a same origin and what that can do to unite our species. Because you look back, you're like, who is your parents, their parents, their parents, yes. my parents, my parents, my parents, and you just keep going back and back yes. and back to the evolution of life in the first place. And so, uh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of discoveries right now in physical anthropology. Uh, the origin of our species keeps getting pushed back. So even 30 years ago, it was thought that Homo sapiens sapiens, our particular species, was 50,000 years old. But now people believe that anatomically modern humans have been around for about 300,000 years. And a lot of the new genetics that is being done on um, on uh, discovered bone fragments shows that we, we we still spread out of Africa, but there were probably multiple migrations, and more importantly, we interbred with Neanderthals and Homo florensis and other other hominids that um, had preceded us or succeeded us as uh, out of Africa. So the story is is changing even as we speak, and so some of the variation. Um, across humans may relate to interbreeding with some of these other hominid species, but in general the way you told it is correct, that if you go far back far enough, we all of us you know, are descended from the same ancestral group of hominids. Um, and that's just and sort of pleasing the, in a way. And even the you seed of life. And even the yeah, seed well of if life you go all life. the way back, yeah. yes. Well, yes, I mean, we can speculate about where life came and from. Nicholas, then the question would then become is, and this is what so many of the indigenous cultures are, are, are pointing out, is that is our species disconnection from the origin and how we all come from that same source, is that the reason why we have so many of the issues in our civilization today? Uh, no, I wouldn't go that far. I mean, first of all, even among other, some of the other animals we discussed earlier, you know, so one pod of killer whales who have identity and cooperation and friendship and all these qualities, can be rather mean to other pods of killer whales and you know they're not humans same with with chimpanzees chimpanzees groups of chimpanzees have this just like we do have this sort of tribalism this sort of in-group bias you know us versus them and they'll patrol the perimeter of their turf and they will kill and eat other chimps that they that they murder um so but it is our highest 
potential pinnacle state of being to embody that deepest sense of empathy for the other that is with their unique expression artistic expression of existence on this on this well I would agree with that spiritual claim but I would I would dispute I mean there's a kind of you're sort of sneaking in a kind of teleology there where you're imagining that you know that that is the the only or right way my claim at the beginning was not that natural selection wanted to make a good to endow mm. us with these good qualities my claim is only that these good qualities countermand the bad ones mm -hmm. which also exist mm -hmm. and uh, and the claim of the indigenous would then be something along the lines of that because the species has deviated away from this natural spirit or source of our origins is so much of the reason why we have many of the issues that we have in our world. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's a possible explanation. Um, I think that, um, I think that there are ways in which the worlds we make for ourselves now because of our capacity for culture, which we innately have, the ability to be a cultural animal is itself a product of natural selection. So we can each fashion these cultures, we can make these enormous technological civilizations, and I do think that those civilizations, there are aspects of them that can alienate us from our roots and certainly feel alienating. So for example, imagine for hundreds of thousands of years we evolved to live in groups where to encounter strangers might have been dangerous and to be with people we know well we were, our evolution shaped us to value that and feel good about that. So to be with friends gives us this warm feeling. And so we want to be with our friends. And so the argument would be that friendship is, enhances our survival. Being with a group of friends is good. You can hunt prey, you can defend yourself against others. So we come to feel, hey, it's good to be with friends because those people who felt it was good to be with friends and hung out with friends were more likely to survive compared to those people who were indifferent to the presence of their friends. Okay, so you can construct that whole argument about how we have these, uh, these, um, these, these uh, warm feelings. So now you take a creature like that and you put that creature in a modern world in which we interact with each other not authentically and face-to-face -face as human beings, but in roles, like bureaucracies. Mm. You go to meet someone at the DMV, mm. and that person doesn't know you and treats you imperiously. Or you move among strangers on a street, for example. Or you go to a workplace and you have superficial, inauthentic interactions with other people, mm. all of which are products of modernity. Mm. And, and those make a creature like us sense danger. Mm. We, we find that alienating. We find that inconsistent with our nature. We find that mm. uh, uh, you know, discombobulating. It, we, we sense that that is potentially a dangerous and, and um, unwholesome set of social interactions. And so we crave a kind of authenticity and real face-to-face -face interactions. So in that regard, I would, I would agree with your point. Yeah. Um, and similarly with the amount of light pollution that's in the metropolis as the children are born without ever seeing the cosmos. The children walking yeah. into a grocery store exchange a sheet of paper for the goods instead of knowing how to grow them from the soil. Yeah. These are very raw disconnections from source and from the breaths of air that sustain us. Yes. The gulps of water that do is, I think, such a per per pertinent point from the um, indigenous culture. Now, okay, here Here's a really um, good one that I want to talk about. So, at least a little bit we need to talk about this. The meme gene interplay. So, meaning that the way that we have now told stories, the way that we have now built tools that have shaped us. We've built cities that have shaped us. This is actually directly from these artificial cities that we were just talking about, how that's shaped us. So in the mimetic evolution, cultural evolution is just moving way faster. The devices that are mm -hmm. everywhere now that are shaping us and the way that we socially interact way faster than the ge slower genetic pace of evolution. How do you see that interplay between memetics and genetics and even people that are choosing to just be like 
like in Silicon Valley and so many other places, they're like, I need to climb up the competence hierarchy. I'm not having children for a long time, maybe even not ever. I just have to keep climbing this competence hierarchy. Yeah. I have to spread these memes, these ideas. All eight billion people are my children, my brothers and sisters. I will spread ideas to them rather than having one child and spreading ideas yeah. to them. What are your thoughts on things like that? Okay, well, I can go in two directions with that. First of all, uh, so this whole notion of memes has gotten far from its original sort of more narrow meaning, uh, which I think Dawkins uh, was trying to argue for, which is a sort of self-replicating idea, just like a gene is a replicator, right? It's in a host, and it replicates itself. Um, so I think one of the most famous examples of this was the, the meme that kill the infidel. So kill individuals who don't share your religion. That's a very powerful idea, because if people don't share your religion, you kill them and there are fewer of them. So therefore, people with your religion that have the belief kill those that don't have your religion become more numerous. So, 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 but memes has now come to mean just sort of ideas that spread, you know, from my brain to your brain, for example. And, um, and there's a sense in which that's the case. But I'd like to then broaden that and address more directly your question, which is this notion of gene culture coevolution, for which there's a ton of work being done in labs around the country. Uh, Joe Henrik is... and. Uh, Ken and uh, and Lalonde in, in Scotland. There's some uh, and uh, and Boyd and Richardson and uh, uh, there are a lot of people that are thinking deeply about about gene culture coevolution. So the idea here is is that um, that human beings have been endowed with the, the capacity for culture. We um, we've also been endowed with the capacity to accumulate culture. So we don't just distribute information and ideas laterally across space. We also distribute information across time, yes. which means that we accumulate all of the knowledge from the past. So when you are born today, you are born into a world in which calculus has been invented already, mm -hmm. and animals have been domesticated, yep. and someone built roads. A hundred billion humans built the civilization. Well, not a hundred billion, but uh, that's about what the no, 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 no. are citing the numbers. Hundred billion people. B. Yeah, well, hundred billion people before us. You were just no, giving, no, that number can't be right. You were just giving the numbers of five plus million years of what is a per. What are we definitely? Yeah, 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 but yeah, almost, yeah. yeah. I don't think, I think that, uh, I, I don't know the precise numbers, but I would be stunned if there had ever been 100, 100 billion 100 people billion. had ever been lived. Well, I could yeah, be right. Okay. I could be wrong. I don't know. <laughs> it seems very high to me. Okay, but anyway. All those people worked so, so hard, hard to, build, to produce. Yeah, yeah, however many they were, yeah. there were a lot of them. <laughs> they worked very hard to produce all this stuff. And we're just born and we inherit it on the day we were born. We get all of this stuff, knowledge about the stars and about uh, nano fabrication and about uh, the tides and figuring out longitude and latitude and how to build roads and chisel stone and, and milk cows and you know all of this stuff that other people had invented and given to us. Then we build on that foundation and create new stuff and transmit it and so forth. So, so culture accumulates and evolves. And, um, and people experiment constantly. So by chance, occasionally we discover an innovation. And in the book I talk about, for instance, accumulative culture with respect to arrow poisons. You know, how did they, how in the Amazon do they make, you know, poison darts? And the preparation of curare, for example, which is not easy to do. You know, over hundreds of years, these people figured out how to prepare curare in very specific ways and very specific steps. And, and it's this capacity for culture that actually makes us the ascendant species on the earth. We have pathetic bodies. Our bodies would be unable to survive in all these environments. And yet we can make parkas and kayaks and dig wells and we can live in deserts and the Arctic. And, uh, and we transmit that knowledge and it's that, that capacity for culture that allows us to have the social conquest of the earth, as E.O. Wilson says. Mm -hmm. Anyway, mm -hmm. so all of that is happening that cultural evolution. And in parallel to that, we also continue to evolve, as you said, at a somewhat slower pace genetically. But the amazing thing is in the last 30 or 40 years, people have begun to understand how these two parallel systems interact. And my favorite and simplest example of this is the example of the domestication of cows. So, so, so humans have an enzyme in us called lactase uh, that's able to digest lactose which is the principal sugar in milk. And all of us have lactase as babies. Why? Because we're suckling at our mother's breast and we drink milk and we need to be able to digest the milk that our mothers feed us. And after we're weaned, we no longer have lactase. Why? Because there's no milk in our diet. There's no reason for us to be able to digest milk in adulthood. 
And yet, uh, billions of people today are able to do that. Why are they able to do that? Well, it turns out that uh, between three and 9,000 years ago, human beings had a cultural innovation, which is they domesticated cattle. They figured out how to breed cattle and feed cattle and contain cattle and create an animal that was available to us to eat and to milk, milk. Yeah. and drink the milk. Yeah. So those members of our ancestors who lived in a world in which they had domesticated cattle now suddenly had an ad those among them who could digest milk had a survival advantage. Mm -hmm. They had another source of food and they had uh, a source of clean hydration yeah. when the water was spoiled. So those individuals who by chance had mutations that had sort of lactase persistence into adulthood outperformed, outbred, had a Darwinian fitness that was higher than those that did not. And what's seen when you go, and then this has been worked out by Tishkoff and other scientists, when you go and you look in Africa at those populations uh, in the last three to 9,000 years, there's been a, multiple domestications of cattle and multiple independent evolutions of the ability to digest uh, lactose that occur in specific populations, but not in nearby human populations that didn't domesticate the cattle. So here we have an example of something human beings invent in historical time, three to 9,000 years, that changes the environment around them, feeds back on them and acts as a selection pressure, and, and changes the trajectory of our genetic evolution. Now all these humans, billions of them, have lactase persistence. And it's not just cattle, there are many examples of this. So it's quite possible that our invention of cities in a similar time frame is making us smarter. Those among us that can live in cities, that have brains that allow us to live in cities, may actually be getting smarter. Um, so different kinds of brains are required to live in cities, let's say, than to live in the country, for example. So here we've invented cities, and again, we're changing that. Or a simple example it might be, you know, medieval lens grinders invent this. I would have died 10,000 years ago. I would have been eaten by a lion, but now I can live. So I pass on my genes from myopia to my children, myopia to my children. And so the species is becoming more myopic because we invent glasses and indoor rooms, it turns out, and books and so forth. So mm -hmm. anyway, being culture co-evolution. Yeah, well also that you gave this example, you, you've given so many of these other examples in your writing as well where you have these little subculture pockets that develop unique skill sets based on their environments and what they need to do to yes. survive in those environments and then that has that gene culture co-evolution that's occurring. And can occur, yeah. That can occur. And what about taking that all the way up to today with these claims about, well, I want to spread my memes out to all 8 billion people. I don't yes. want to focus on genetics. I want to focus on memes. And now I have information technology so I can spread memes way faster. Yes. So what do you... What are thoughts well, about? I think, I mean, if you're asking, is the internet changing us? I think we won't know the answer to that for a couple thousand years. But I think, yes, if I had to guess. Could memetics so, be more important for climbing up competence hierarchies than genetics now? Yes. Yes, I think the capacity to, to manipulate information is hugely important and getting more so. But a, a simpler example might be Google Glass. So let's say Google Glass, you know, has facial recognition software and can call up the internet. So I'm walking through down the street and the glass is detecting everyone I see and pulling up their biography and then using natural, uh, using uh, artificial intelligence to label them friend or foe. So I no longer, something that was crucial for hundreds of thousands of years in our evolution, which is to detect other people. Yeah. Remember we talked about that earlier, detecting individual identity and knowing whether they mean you ill or well we can delegate to a technology. Yeah. So I no longer need to be quite as social a creature. I can just rely on a technology to recognize other people and call up their data and uh, tell me whether they are friendly or, or mean me ill. And you know, feed into my ear, say, this person is your friend. You know, his name is Alan, treat him well. Mm -hmm. Versus, you know, this person is a bad guy. You know, we find him in the criminal database, mm -hmm. you know, walk away, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that, that kind of technology, I think, is going to reshape how we interact with each other, but over very long time periods, not over, you know, the, the people you alluded to who are climbing this pyramid in their own lifetimes, they're, they're not going to change the species in 50 years. It's a, these are long horizon things, but, but still discernible over historical time. 
it's it's f- interesting looking at what kids 50 years from now will be saying about what we used as these technological appendages and how they affected gene culture coevolution. Yeah, I'm sure I wouldn't say 50 years necessarily, but but there absolutely are things technologies that we're inventing now that are changing the fitness landscape for human beings that are yeah. enhancing the prospects of yeah. survival for some of us and not for others and faster than ever doing that process. I would say, yes um, but it's not just the speed it's like the impact of selection so for example elephants are evolving in real time right now to be tuskless that was a crazy example yes so yeah. right now in in the last 30 years because of human predation and elephants that don't have tusks survive Elephants with tusks get killed. So, but that's a very powerful selection force. In other words, hunters go out and kill these and not those. There's nothing quite as powerful that's affecting us, right? There's not like half the population is being exterminated because they have this this set of features, and that would rapidly weed it out. Um, So, some people speculate that we'll all be more religious in the future because one of the ascendant memes right now has to do with reproduction. So educated people tend to have fewer, mm. and non-religious people mm. tend to have fewer children than religious people. Mm. So mm-hmm. so brains that are endowed with a capacity for religion mm. tend to be more fecund So in, in this historical moment. So, um, so you're gonna get more of them. And what are the future religions that don't necessarily yet exist that can potentially bring the entire species together again something like we all come from the same source we all come from the same I don't origin. know I mean I like Things you know like I like I like yeah, I'm very partial to the Star Wars religion you know the Jedi the, the you know these old uh, you know the notion of a force but uh, I find it very hard to imagine that human beings will converge on a single religion that doesn't seem likely to me is Nicholas would you say that that this world that we live on and the entire process of going from source until here and all that is is this one big artistic expression i don't know the answer to that question what is it i mean my like? favorite my favorite my favorite answer to that question is in uh, in uh, stephen hawking's a brief history of time he very nonchalantly says you know, when they're working, he's just trying to figure out when the Big Bang occurred and how, and he's solving problems having to do with black holes. And in that mechanical voice of his, he I can't imitate it, I wish I could. He says, while these discoveries do not shed light on whether there is or isn't a creator, they do put a constraint on when he did his creating. <laughs> so, you know, I, uh, I don't think we can answer those types of questions with science. I, we were talking about this beforehand. I really hope that science can get to the point of being able to better poke and probe at that because then that will be a, a more beautiful melding between spirituality and science mm-hmm. in the future. Um, okay, I, we really need to talk about this subject. Um, this is, a, a lot of ways, this is how I see the world. Our show is called Simulation and uh, in for a variety of reasons, but one of the reasons why, and we mentioned this earlier too, is that it's really cool to think these thought experiments where you say, well, would this same topology of uh-huh. social networks with humans have evolved if we ran a simulation of the species uh-huh. again? And so here's this question then to ask, and and you know you kind of do this a little bit at the human nature lab you called this thing also you gave an example of what would be like a forbidden experiment so like to what would it be like to evolve uh, a simulation of a couple of humans on an island by themselves and where they didn't have any of the same endowments that we had like we have from these hundred billion or however many people that have made the world so what would how would they pick up a language how would they pick up tools how would they yes. pick up all these things so speak to the importance of the work that that human yeah, nature so, lab and that that can reveal for yeah, us yeah so the the argument is that you know that if i take a human and or like a monkey and just feed it and give it water it'll be born a little thing it'll grow up and it'll have an adult type body 
that's innate. That's like, you know, the, 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 the genes shape the structure and function of the body. Now, you could starve the animal and get stunted growth, but in a kind of wholesome environment, this is the body you get because of the genes. Well, genes don't just shape the structure and function of our minds, I'm sorry, of our bodies. They also, we're increasingly discovering, shaping the structure and function of our behaviors. And they don't just do that, they also, as I argue, shape the structure and function of our societies. There's a kind of innate kind of society that we're endowed to make, just like there's an innate kind of body we're endowed to make. And, um, and so the question is, you know, how can we prove that? So in a, in a kind of mad scientist fantasy, what we would do is, is we would take a group of babies that had like no cultural learning, and we would abandon them on an island and let them grow up, you know, with plentiful food and stuff, and, and um, see what kind of society they made. Now, of course, this is unethical and cruel and could not be done, and it's been called the forbidden experiment. You simulate it. Well, and we do. Yeah. And we do. Yeah. But, um, and so, um, and, but this forbidden experiment, there have been times, we are told, that very powerful monarchs have done something similar to that for different reasons. For example, um, Herodotus writes about a pharaoh, Samtik I, who wondered what kind of language was ancestral. That is to say, what kind of language was innate? And so these monarchs would contrive to take a, a babies and give them to mute shepherds to raise up in the mountains and then see, well, what language did they speak when they grew up, for example, in order to understand like what, what, what language capacity is innate within us. So obviously we can't do those kind of experiments. So I was trying to figure out like what would be reasonable proxies for this. And one idea I had was to look at unintentional groups of people thrown together unintentionally, for instance, in shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. And between 1500 and 1900, there were 9,000 approximately shipwrecks. This is such a cool study. That During goes, yeah, the uh, yeah. European exploration of the world, I found 20 shipwrecks that had 19 people that were isolated for at least two months. And the question is, when these people were thrown on this island and they had to make a society, what kind of society did they make? And what were the qualities of that society? And what of those qualities was associated with success or failure? You know, did they survive or not? So I found this corpus of 20 shipwrecks, these examples. I got all the original um, narratives of the survivors, we, all the modern archeological excavations of the shipwreck sites, looking to see, did they work together to build a well or a signal tower? Did they, did they have hierarchy? Did they have one dwelling or several dwellings, you know, for the crew? and the passengers, for instance, or the officers and the crew or whatever. And to make a long story short, many of these qualities that we were discussing earlier as innately fundamental in us are also seen in these examples. But that wasn't the only type of thing I looked at. I also looked at intentional communities. For instance, uh, uh, communes in the 1960s or communitarian movements in the 19th century. You know, uh, uh, the Shakers, for example, or the Kibbutzes uh, in Israel. I looked at um, scientific settlements, so scientists that were stranded in Antarctica for to winter over, groups of 30 scientists that lived in this community, what kind of social order did they make for themselves? Pitcairn, for instance, or the Shackleton expedition, so many, many examples. And then finally, in my lab, we've developed, a, speaking most closely to simulation, we've developed a kind of software that's integrated with Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we can, we in a godlike way can create temporary artificial societies of real people and tens of thousands of people we basically paid small amounts of money to from Amazon Mechanical Turk, but we've also done this with other sources of subjects. And they can come to our laboratory and we can in a godlike way control, like engineer the society they are in to have, let's say, this topology, mm. a very natural topology of social interactions or an unnatural topology and drop them in and say, okay, which does better? Is, are people, when they're dropped into a natural topology, better able to cooperate? Yes. Mm -hmm. If they're dropped into an unnatural topology, no, they won't cooperate. Or maybe even an even more communal topology, could cooperation be even better? Maybe, maybe. and we are doing some new experiments to see if we can increase cooperation. Very good question. Mm. So we're doing all of that work, so we created artificial societies. And across all those examples, unintentional societies, intentional societies, artificial societies, again and again, we find that human beings innately are equipped with certain capacities to make particular kinds of social order. And furthermore, that this social order is very, is good and universal.
And then what other ways would you manipulate the um, artificial environments that people are um, going into to see if we could, um, you, you gave the example of potentially increasing cooperation. What other uh, unique insights would you would you say you in the lab are most interested in exploring with tweaking those environments? Okay, so one of the things we're very excited about right now is our research on what we call hybrid systems of humans and machines. So we're doing lots of experiments in which we we create systems of people into which we intersperse some bots, let's say. Um, and so you then create a hybrid system of humans and machines that are interacting on a level playing field. And what we're trying to do in my lab is develop forms of artificial intelligence, particular forms. So we're not interested in developing super smart AI to replace human cognition, like AlphaGo, for example, that can play Go or the poker playing AI, which is unbelievable. No, we're not, we're not inventing super smart AI to replace human cognition. We're developing dumb AI to supplement human interaction. So the question is, can we develop machines that when we intersperse them into humans, because the humans are smart, the machines act like catalysts, lowering the activation energy and facilitating the interactions or reactions between humans. Mm. Let me give you some examples. So a, a very simple example might be Alexa or other kinds of personal assistants. People don't realize that those assistants are programmed to facilitate your interaction with that assistant. And so that, ass that assistant, for instance, is programmed to be very obedient. It doesn't require you to say, please, Siri, or thank please, you. thank you, and all that yeah. stuff. So you then get entrained to behave very rudely. And then you leave your ass that assistant, and you go into the real world, and you interact with other humans, and now maybe you're rude. Mm -hmm. So this machine is changing your interactions, not with it, but with, with other, other humans. humans yeah. So we need to think about how we program these machines to make you, let's say, more polite rather than less polite. Yes. Even more despite creative or whatever. More deeply pursuing your own divine. For instance, goals, all these things. For yeah, instance, yeah. exactly. So we need to be mindful of the fact that as we introduce these social machines in our midst, they are transforming how we interact, not with them, but with each other. Mm. And this happens, for example, with autonomous vehicles. So, so right now the concern is how do we, how should the autonomous vehicles be programmed to maximize the safety of the. Uh, people in the car. But actually, maybe what we should be concerned about is how should autonomous vehicles be programmed to optimally modify the human driver's behavior on the road? So can we program these cars in a way that changes your driving behavior to make you less likely to crash into him? Mm -hmm. It's not about whether you're less likely to crash into this, the driverless car. It's about how the driverless car changes your, uh, your ability to yeah. crash into someone else. So we are experimenting in my lab right now with these types of ideas, hybrid systems of humans and machines or humans and bots online. And we have a whole suite of ideas on ways to develop and test bots to reduce racism online, reduce the problem of fake news online, increase cooperation online, uh, increase sharing of information within firms, and so forth and so on. I love how you have that meta perspective on the way that we're developing the robots and AIs and being very aware and vigilant of the way that we interact with them and how that's going to influence the way we interact with each other outside of that relationship. And that's so evident already with our devices that we have and our level of um, aggression or less empathy when we're typing behind yes. a keyboard versus looking at yes, someone else yes. in the eyes and yeah, and seeing that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, okay, and just to quick questions that we like asking um, on the way out of the show. Uh, do you think we're in a simulation? We could be, but I don't think we are. And why? I just don't think the fabric of the physical world is consistent with an entity that could design the universe, but it's unprovable, so. And then what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Consciousness. And why? Well, because that's how we are endowed with the ability even to see the world, right, and to think about it. I mean, absent consciousness, I don't, I don't think we would even be, we wouldn't even be able to ask these questions. So, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, there are, there's a whole category of things, which I'm sure you've thought about, which arise because of what's known as the phenomenon of emergence, right? So, wholes have properties not 
present in the parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And so the fact that you can take a set of neurons and interact and connect them in a particular way, and because of that pattern of connection, you get consciousness is miraculous to me. Consciousness is an emergent property of neuronal tissue. And then there's also the panpsychist ideas of consciousness is everything is all that is yes all whether they are, yes yeah, yeah. these are very interesting yeah. things I, I nicholas this has been such a pleasure talking to you it's been an honor having oh, you thank on you our for show. having me <laughs> we're thank so you, grateful Alan. thank you so much for having <laughs> me so great no, that's great thank you for all of your incredible work in the space and also thank you everyone for tuning in we greatly appreciate it we would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode let us know what you're thinking and also check out the links in the bio below check out the links to nicholas's pages as well as his lab his twitter profile and his newest book blueprint the evolutionary origins of a good society please check that out and go and share more conversations with your family your friends your coworkers, people online about the subjects that we discussed today about our blueprint for goodness go and share those everyone and also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. Support Simulation, our links are below. To our Patreon, our cryptocurrency link, our PayPal link. You can design cool merch and get paid as well. Support us. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace. That's Thank a you. wrap. Thank you so much for having me. That, that was, was great. so fun.